Matthew chapter 6 is in the middle of what's commonly called the Sermon on the Mount. I don't like to call it the Sermon on the Mount because that kind of puts it in the category of some sermons you like, some sermons you don't like. Some people call it the hard sayings of Jesus. I like to call it God's will for man. God did not send his son into the world. The word of God was not made flesh to come and just give a sermon. He came and gave us commands. And in the Great Commission, he said, go make disciples and baptize them and teach them to observe everything I commanded you. He concludes this discourse with the parable of the wise man who built his house on the rock. When the floods came, the winds blew, the house on the rock stood strong. So is the one who hears and does the things I'm saying. So let's interrupt the sermon. Here I am calling it a sermon, right? Let's interrupt God's commands for man in the new covenant. Matthew 6, 19, do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust corrupt and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. In other words, what you value the most is where your heart is. And you need to value heavenly things more than earthly things. Earthly things decay. If you put your faith and trust in politics or in economics, those things are not stable. But put your faith in heavenly things. Gas can go up to $20 a pint, and you're going to stand strong. You're going to make it. You just heard a testimony of Mike Blount, his faith getting rattled here and there, but he continues to stand, continues to trust. Verse 22, the lamp of the body is the eye. If therefore your eye is good, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? We'll come back to that. No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon, or you cannot serve God and your possessions. You cannot serve God and materialism. You cannot serve God and the American dream. You serve God and his vision. Otherwise, you've got two masters running your life. And in tough times, you will not stand. Therefore, verse 25, Therefore I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air, for they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns. Yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? Which of you, by worrying, can add one cubit to his stature? Worry will not make you taller. It'll actually make you shorter, right? I'm going to go eat worms and die. All right. Verse 28, so why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. And yet I say to you that even Solomon... And all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Solomon was rich, 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 rich. Now, if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is, and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, it's a good fire starter, grass cuttings, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? This is a faith-building passage. Verse 31, Therefore do not worry, saying, What shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? For after these things, the Gentiles, the pagans, the unbelievers seek. That's their priorities, earthly things. For your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things shall be added to you. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, 
for tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. You got enough challenges today to be concerned with than to be all concerned about tomorrow. As believers, we are to live in such a way that we face tomorrow as the Lord wills. As the Lord wills, tomorrow I'm going to do that. We trust him. We allow him to interrupt us if he wants to even. I believe obedience to this passage involves verse 22 and 23. The lamp of the body is the eye. If therefore your eye is good, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? He's talking about your perception, your outlook, the vantage point from which you you view things. If it's from a heavenly place, then you're going to be filled with light. If it's not, you're going to be filled with darkness. It's going to be great darkness. So how do we make sure our treasures aren't laid on, up on earth? By keeping the heavenly perspective. How do we keep from serving two masters? By keeping God's viewpoint of things in mind. How do we not worry about life and food and old age and children and college and all that, by looking at things the way God looks at them. How he values things is what is to be the governing force. And so by allowing that value to affect the way we see, it enables us to exercise the faith he's given us. To everyone has been given a measure of faith. It's saving faith, right? By grace are you saved through faith. That faith is not of yourselves. It is a gift of God. Faith is a fruit of the Spirit, It's a gift of the Spirit, but if we have a negative outlook on stuff, we won't exercise it. We won't use it. We'll we'll just get all down in the gutter. So I'd like to speak to you for the next few minutes, a perspective on perception. Can we say perspective? Can we say perception? The word perspective has two meanings. uh, If you draw a perspective, it's a three-dimensional drawing on a flat piece of paper a two-dimensional surface, so as to give the right impression of their dimensions in relationship to each other. I remember taking drafting class in my sophomore year. I was thrilled to be able to figure out how they drew three-dimensional things just on a flat piece of paper. And so um, that's what perspective is. But it is also a particular attitude toward or way of regarding It's a point of view, an outlook, a viewpoint, a stance, a position, thoughts regarding something. What you think about something is your perspective. Your personal opinion is your perspective. So today I'm going to share your perspective on perception. Perception is the ability to see or hear or become aware of something through the senses. So you feel it, you touch it, you smell it, you hear it, you see it. You're aware of it, that's perception. But it's also a way of regarding, understanding, or interpreting something. It's a mental impression, a discernment, an appreciation, a recognition, a realization, an awareness, an art of understanding or view. The first day I ever saw Miss Yvette, I perceived this is someone I want to meet. That's perception. Luke 11 also is involved in uh, the writer writing the commands of Christ. In the midst of those commands, he words it this way, the lamp of the body is the eye. Therefore, when your eye is good, your whole body also is full of light. But when your eye is bad, your body also is full of darkness. Therefore, verse 35, Because of that, therefore, take heed that the light which is in you is not darkness. The New Century Version renders it as follows. So be careful not to let the light in you become darkness. It's possible to have the right perception on things, and then something happens that disillusions you, and now you're fearful or negative or doubting or traumatized. 
the New Living Translation says, make sure the light that you think you have is not actually darkness. We live in Texas, and we've got our rights, and we've got our view on stuff, and we've got our opinions, don't we? The world revolves around Texas. Some people accuse us of thinking that. I know the biggest ranch in the world is in Texas and stuff like that. But it's possible to think you're right and to be completely wrong and not know it because the light that is in you is actually darkness. So we got to be sure that our perception is right. So it's my desire today to encourage you and I, I'm preaching to myself, to have God's perception on stuff. Three weeks ago, my brother was texting me, and he had just heard his son end his life. So we had the funeral um, over a week ago. The press release was he died of the unseen wounds of war. That's a perception that is encouraging. But at the funeral, the pastor changed the perception of everybody in the room when he shared a story of a woman that went to the wrong house and tried to get in. The key wouldn't work. Someone opened the door, and she realized she was at the wrong house. So she had the decision, do I continue to stay there, wanting it to be my house and asking why it isn't my house and barging her way in and trying to make the place hers, or does she move on to find the right place? And then he applied that story. Stop knocking on the door of why. You're at the wrong house. Run to the tower of trust. When we don't understand, we trust, right? You may not understand how this building is built, but you trust the engineers at Midwest Metal Building knew what they were doing when they built the thing, right? We trust. And so it is with the unseen things in life. We don't know why things happen or why people do what they do, but we can trust God that he's got it all in his perception, he knows what's going on. As humans, we live in, in linear, we live a linear life. I know many of us are mosaic thinkers but, and multitaskers, but really we live linear from one day to the next. The old country song Chris, Christopherson wrote, one day at a time. I think that's the hymn at AA meeting, sweet Jesus. So looking at life, we're like the little kid looking at a parade through a hole in the wooden fence, thinking he knows all about the parade. But up in the tree, his buddy can see the beginning of the parade and the ending of the parade, and he has a greater understanding. Well, in life, we trust the one who has the ultimate understanding of it all, right? And so it is with our perception. We live in a linear world. We may think we see things 20-20. But we must be careful lest the things we see are dark. Now, how is this encouraging me? My dad, he's in Texas, right? He's from Atlanta, 900 miles away. Come see my, my kids while I'm here in this part of the world. So he comes to see me. Wednesday, he falls down and breaks the top of his femur bone off where it connects to the ball and winds up getting a, uh, they call it a half hip replacement. Now, what's funny about that is for years he's been saying, I need a hip replacement. Well, he got one. And so he's going to be in town for weeks. I didn't plan on this. I didn't look forward to this. But you know what? I'm keeping, I'm keeping a positive perception. I'm, I'm looking for God's perception of this. He refused to use a walker. I mean, this guy's a giant killer. His whole life he's done stuff. He hates using a cane. And so it was bound to happen sooner or later. And I'm thankful it didn't happen in a truck stop somewhere in deep Alabama on the way home or something. Or in a ditch. Or in Atlanta, his hometown. I feel like I'm the most convenient kid in the family. He's right here, right? So, uh, and, and our town has some good people in the medical profession. So I'm counting my blessings. But I have a decision to make. Am I, am I going to look at that that way? How we take things is so important. Some people jump at the, th- jump at the chance to take things at their most negative, hurtful, painful, experience, and then they live life all offended when they're the ones doing it to themselves. It's like they're picking up a knife and stabbing themselves when nobody even had a knife in their hand. 
How dare you do this to me? That's what we do when we do not realize the light in us may be darkness. Here's two guys arguing it out. One says it's four boards. The other one says it's three. From their perception, they're both right. But from our perception, it's just an optical illusion. It's not any boards. It's just a drawing, guys. Calm down. <laughs> from this guy's perception, it's a boat. I'm going to get off this island where I'm trapped. But from the boat's perception, it's land. <laughs> No longer wandering aimlessly in the open sea. A boat. Land. Is this a duck or is it a rabbit? Depends on your perception. Is it a six or a nine? You know, at restaurants where they give you numbers to get your food, I love to mess with them by putting my numbers upside down. <laughs> All right, we're going to see a video that illustrates how we see things, and when we see things is a whole big part of the picture. Sometimes it's a timing issue. Hey, you. You got to get down. Come on. AmeriQuest Mortgage, proud sponsor of the NFL. This has a fractured fibula, given a mild sedative, so I can be able to go on tomorrow. Daddy's going to be so excited. That killed him. Paging Dr. Palmer. Dr. Barbara Palmer, dial 452. All the boys are calling crazy girls. I hope she sings this tonight. I know. Hey, Dad, pull over. We need gum. Come on. Oh, honey. Here's some money. What do we got here? I love it. I'm her daddy. Right. How we see determines what we see. And may the Lord help us all to be quick to repent when we realize we're looking at stuff carnally and not from his perspective. Bad perception brings undesirable results. Sometimes refusing to perceive things right is wrong. Whoever shuts his ears to the cry of the poor will also cry himself and not be heard. Intentionally to turn away from an opportunity to help somebody, that is not good. You're going to reap what you sow. Good perception brings desirable results. He who has a generous eye will be blessed, for he gives of his bread to the poor. Misperception brings bad perception results. So a misperception can be as bad as an evil outlook on things. Where there is no vision, Proverbs 29, the people perish. He that keeps the law, happy is he. Where there is no revelation, where there is no, one translation says, where there is no redemptive revelation, people perish. May God help us to look at things redemptively instead of like it's the end of the world. This is part of a deception that happened in America at the end of the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th. It's a map of canals on the surface of Mars. Headlines like this were seen. Martians build two immense canals in two years. So as these two astronomers, the first one started and the second one followed up, made things even worse, over the course of two years, he noticed some things had changed on the surface of Mars. 
And so he thought the Martians were working like crazy. This globe reflects their perception of Mars at the time. But the Hubble telescope speaks otherwise. What was going on? Well, it's surmised by some that one of those astronomers had an eye condition where he may have actually been mapping things that were in his eye. Sometimes the problems we see are actually us. Sometimes the stick we see is in our own eye. That's why Jesus said, if you see a speck in someone's eye, get the log out of yours first. Then you will see clearly how to get the speck out of your brother's eye. What is he talking about? I think he's talking about blind spots. Some people are offensive, insensitive, um, need to be educated in some way. It's like a blind spot. So somebody's got to talk to them, right? But if you go to them all mad and angry and upset, you're going to over do things, and you'll be more blinding than helping. You've got to help your perception to get right before you can help somebody else. All right. Here's some examples of misperception. One is deceptions. The problem with being deceived is you are deceived. We just shared the illustration that happened in America at the end of the 19th century, beginning of the 20th. That was a deception that took the nation by storm. Man, the Martians are building like crazy. No wonder people went nuts when there was that radio te- uh, broadcast, remember, where they faked the Martian invasion? Wasn't that? Yeah. War of the Worlds, yeah. And it was just a radio drama. People took it seriously. Another example of misperception is fearfulness. Somebody said an acronym for fear, a good one, would be false evidence appearing real. Fearfulness will impact the way you see things. Malcolm Gladwell wrote a book called David and Goliath. I like that book. He doesn't take the miraculous out of the story of David and Goliath, but he shares right right there from the Scriptures, right there in the text, that Goliath had some issues that made him not all that bad. And so his point in the book is sometimes the things that scare us We need God's help, of course, to face them. But sometimes they've got their problems too. They're not all that scary. Example, he told David, you come to me with sticks. David didn't come to him with sticks. He came with a stick. That's double vision, right? Somebody had to carry the old man's armor. He was pretty old. Um, Let me get my hands on you. Why? He couldn't couldn't, uh, aim. So he had some vision problems himself. So anyway, But fear makes things bigger than they are. Imaginations can be a misperception. Oh, man, it's going to be real bad. How many times have people predicted the end of the world? You know, you sell a lot of books, and then nobody wants to buy anymore. You get them cheap then. I'll get it when it goes on sale after doomsday. A well-known spiritual warfare verse is about pulling down strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. And people use that in spiritual warfare rallies. Maybe you have. I don't mean to be offensive. But that verse is actually talking about our mind. It's not talking about territorial spirits out there. But they'll take that verse and then put it with the story in the book of Daniel and some other verses and build a sermon or a theory, and they're going to go out and tear down strongholds. Meanwhile, the stronghold of of imaginations is in operation sometimes in those rallies. Oh, the devil's been bad. You know, somebody saw the devil one day outside of church crying. They said, what's wrong, devil? You're not in hell yet. He says, "Uh, they're blaming me for everything in that church. (laughs) Big misperception in our world is prejudices. Racism, tribalism, politics can affect... I mean, we're living in an era when people are so quick to label you. It's like they got a labeler. They don't even have a labeler anymore. They just got a box of labels to stick on people. Oh, you're one of those. And they just throw people in containers. And and if you don't fit in their container, they're going to make you fit. Prejudices. Some people suffer with ageism. They don't like old people. This is an aging simulator suit. 
that some nursing homes and rehab centers use to train their staff. It includes goggles that impairs the vision, uh, earbuds that impairs the hearing, weights that impairs movement, and painful devices in the joints that creates pain, and they'll have their employees wear this for hours at a time to give them empathy with what it feels like to be 100 years old. is what Jesus did for us, so that he might be a more merciful high priest, so that he could be touched with the feelings of our infirmities. He became one of us. So his perception isn't just based on his omniscience, but experience. (laughs) Projections will project things And what we're projecting is influencing how we're seeing things. Well, they don't like me. Really? Are you sure they're not just busy? You know, the world doesn't revolve around us. Oh, you don't like me either then. (laughs) Projections. We all do it. Here's a slice of a Big Mac. So in your mind, it's easy to project what the rest of the picture looks like. And you think you've got the whole picture. We really don't have the whole picture. That's why uh, you have a whole lot less strife in your marriage when you just say, help me understand, rather than doing what I have done. Here's the re- Who wants to see the rest of the picture? That's not a Big Mac. That's Reba McIntyre. (laughs) So that's projections. Oh, pastor, that's just a joke. That's not true. I'm going to prove it to you that we all project. I'm going to show you a paragraph. If you've seen it before, I know you didn't memorize it, but all of us will be able to read this if we're able to read, and the letters are not in the right place. Let's read it together. It doesn't matter in what order the letters in a word are. The only important thing is that the first and last letter be at the right place. The rest can be a total mess, and you can still read it. You've got the first and the last letter, the... The, the mind doesn't need a W-H-O-L-E, what is that? The mind just projects the word, see? And we do that in our relationships with each other. We do that in our relationship with God. We do that in our relationship with, with our enemies. We just project stuff all the time. And the Lord is calling us to repent. Another perspective on perception, a misperception is filters. We filter things out that contradict our perception. And it can happen subconsciously and not even know it. Pastor, this is a bunch of psychobabble. No, it's not. It's the truth. It will help you to live a life of faith and look at stuff, look at disappointments differently than you've ever looked at it before. It's the truth. The world needs people with faith that look at things from his perspective. All right, I'm going to show you a riddle. There's a mistake in this next meme. I'm going to give you five seconds to spot it, and then I'm going to take it away. And I'll ask for a show of hands. Don't don't speak out what it is, but ask for a show of hands if you got it. 1,001, 1,002, 1,003, 1,004, 1,005. All right? Just a show of hands. Who spotted the mistake? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13. Now, besides Joseph, who was in the first service, who has seen this before? Okay, so two of you have seen it before. All right, let me solve it for you. This is because of filtering. Can you manage this one in five seconds? Can you spot, spot a mistake here?
my mother uh, used to do calligraphy, and we have a, uh, a thing that she did at our home that had a little sketch of a rose, and it says, all the flowers of tomorrow are in the seeds of today. But it says, all the, the flowers, all the, the flowers are in the seeds of today. So it's even in, in her work, it's possible to filter out things even that you do yourself. All right, now let's use our own natural vision as a metaphor. I'm not an optometrist nor an ophthalmologist, but I do wear glasses, so. Uh, one thing that messes with our perception in the natural realm of seeing is dizziness. When you're dizzy, you don't see things clearly. When you're drunk, you certainly don't see things clearly. At um, the age of 19, I got drunk a couple times. I couldn't even read, and that was my third beer. <laughs> So in defensive driving, you don't have to get drunk to prove it. Pastor said something. I got to prove it. It's true. Don't be calling me tomorrow. I can drink at five. No. Just take defensive driving. You'll get the opportunity sooner or later. And most of those classes have what's called drunk goggles. You put them on and you see life from the perspective of being drunk. It's all blurry and stuff. Sometimes when trauma happens, our perception's not right. You don't want to trust your feelings at that time. Yeah. Oh, you just know things are as they are. When they're not, you're just traumatized. You're rattled. Another Malcolm Gladwell book Steve Joy gave me is Blink. It's a book on decision making. And one of the chapters, he talks about the need to have oxygen in your blood. And he relates several cases in law enforcement where tragedy was abetted simply because the people involved were able to get their breath back. If you're rattled, you may make the wrong decision. So know when your perception's off and don't be voicing poison to people because then you got another mess to clean up. Another example of poor vision is double vision. Things can appear twice. I think drunkenness can involve this too. So now you no longer have just a problem. You've got more problems. Things just, you jump to conclusions that things are worse than they are. It's an eye problem. It's a perception problem. Look at things how they really are. You can be nearsighted. Can't see things far away because you're so focused on us four and no more. The whole world's going to hell in a handbasket and you're worried about, you know, um, socks that you can't find. And it's the end of the world. That's Spiritually, that is just being too nearsighted. Too farsighted. Concerned about every prayer request you see on social media all over the world, it would destroy you. God set up the body of Christ for us to function in localities. Jesus himself stayed within, during his ministry, stayed within a 70 miles of his hometown, I think. And the whole world was going to hell in a handbasket, but he focused the assignment God had for him. He said, only say and do the things Father wants me to. But I'm leaving and sending the Holy Spirit, and you guys are going to go into all the world. Thomas went to India. Peter went to Rome, and Paul went up into Asia and over into Athens and Ephesians, but he didn't go to India. But Thomas did. We all have our assignments that God's given us, so we got to keep our perception clear as to what God has assigned us to do. Uh, Proverbs has a verse in it that says, the eyes of a fool are on the ends of the earth. The light that shines afar that shines the brightest nearest home. Another thing that causes poor, poor vision is eye injuries. Get, uh, your eye blackens so much, you're swollen shut, you can't see through it, or an eye can be destroyed through a car wreck or something. Uh, blindness can be the result. Spiritually, it can be an unhealed hurt that God wants to heal that has skewed the way you see everything. Nobody can be trusted. That's the words of somebody that's been hurt. What's the remedy for that? 
medicine. The medicine of God's word. So powerful. Who was able to come and attend any of the meetings that we have with Dan Mola? All right. He preaches the gospel with as much passion as you've ever heard it applied to every single area and issue of our life. And when you listen to him, it impacts your perception. We put the services we had with him online. At the time, I think the record we had was like 300 viewings. The last service we had with him is over 16,000 viewings. The first one's over 12,000 viewings and more in the middle. Why? meeting a need. American Christians' perceptions is not single. It's looking on the temporal thing and not through the eternal eyes. And we're getting shook up and our lives are being built on sand and not rocks. Another cause of poor vision are contagions. Spiritually, this is people who um, are negative. Another proverb says, make no friendship with an angry man lest you set a snare for your soul. I'm not saying we shun folks ever. We, we relate to people redemptively, right? There's always hope. But you don't want to allow people to influence the way you think and see life. So you don't go on vacations with negative folks or hang out with them. When you see them, you're kind, you're loving, you're redemptive, but you've got to protect your heart, guard your heart with all diligence, for out of it flow the issues of life. And we're back where we started. Can we read this together? The lamp of the body is the eye. Therefore, when your eye is good, your whole body also is full of light. But when your eye is bad, your body also is full of darkness. Therefore, take heed that the light which is in you is not darkness. Let's pray. Father, I pray that we would all look at things the way you would have us to look at them. That we would fight the fight of faith to see clearly from your perception that we would cut through the fog of circumstances and feelings and traumas and see things from the vantage point of the gospel and the finished work of you on the cross. In Jesus' name. Lord, I pray as as we sing another song, Lord, that we would focus our affections on things above and that you, Lord, would wash our eyes, that you would clear our vision, that no one here would perish under the load of circumstances. But Lord, we would see things from your vantage point. In Jesus' name.